Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I'll be your host. And today, I'm joined with my good friend, Doug Hagerin. Hey, Doug. Good morning, Kirk. Good afternoon, wherever you may be. And I know we were late, and I know everybody was waiting in line. And right now, it's the mad rush, for just like it was when Cabbage Patch dolls were there for Christmas. I know everybody's just trying to get in. So welcome. I hope you can get through this, the you know skinny door, and uh, and we can get everybody lined up. So. It's funny you mentioned Cabbage Patch. I'm thinking back to my youth when even the boys were wanting to have Cabbage Patch dolls. And before anyone skewers me for saying dolls aren't just for girls, uh, back when I grew up, they sure were. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're not, not have, anymore. <laughs> you did not have dolls when you were a boy when I was a kid, unless you wanted to get beat up or made fun of for the next 20 years of your life. But uh, But Cabbage Patch actually bridge that gap where all the boys I knew were in line trying to get cabbage patch. Like we we're, we're, that was like the, um, that was like the Bitcoin of, <laughs> of our era. You know? yep. like, and I want to insert that in the middle of that, just similar to the cabbage patch craze, there was the beanie baby craze. And, and I, I tell you, Ty Warner, the founder of beanie baby Ty company is my entrepreneurial hero. This man made the greatest financial moves in the history unemotionally. He had this pro this toy that was becoming iconic. People are collecting it. People are selling it. And right at the height, he sold out and became a, and a big, I think he sold it for, I don't know, $4 billion, $5 billion, walked away. Beanie Babies literally crashed in value within within months of it it's the greatest selling at the hype story i've ever seen he knew he's probably looking at all these people going you know what i don't get it it's a bag filled animals <laughs> i'm strike it's right up there with the pet rock and uh and chia chia pets <laughs> hey don't make fun <laughs> of the pet rocks doug they have personalities too and feelings so and they do have feelings and they are <laughs> and they are and they always feel pressed upon but they are yeah, okay yeah, that's a geology <laughs> joke but that uh, that being said, you know, pet rocks are still around and they still sell. It's <laughs> so crazy. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it, it's crazy. I, I don't get it. But, you know, it, it every era has their their beanie baby. They have their cabbage patch. Every era has got it. And uh, I'm trying to remember what, what it was when my kids were kids where there was something that they all had to have. And it's always something, you know, it's just there's don't make enough of it and we need it. And like, if I don't have it, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. And it's like, God, like no wonder parents lose their mind uh, yeah. every single day because oh, kids, yeah. they demand it. And if they don't get it, they're, the world's going to end. I'm like, okay. Well, that'll be a good segue mm -hmm. for what we're going to talk about today because the marketing and the media, right? And pushing, push, push. I'll just leave at this. Mm -hmm. Ty Warner's net worth as of August, 2023, still $5.8 billion. He was 477 on the billionaires list. I, he's my hero here. Listen, you know, I know just want to bow down to Ty. Anyway, we can move on. It's, it's, it's all good, Doug. Cause when I, when I, when I look back at this and I think, well, uh, of all the people, it, what was it? Die Hard was, was, there was a quote where the guy was like, Christmas movie. I just want to sit on the beach and earn my 20%. And I'm thinking like 20%, like this was in the eighties, right? <laughs> like this was back when 20% was normal, really yeah. like a, a bearer bond for 20% tax-free sitting on a beach. That sounds pretty good. Why would a guy with a few billion dollars want to do anything but that? But anyway, I digress. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to, we're going to get started. We got, I mean, Doug is, Doug has been a fiend this week. He sent me more charts than I have to do with. So I'm going to try to get through some of these, but uh, before we begin, I do want to point out a few things, um, and I want to share my screen because Doug was nice enough to send this, uh, and and I thought it was hilarious. And <laughs> this is CNBC. Um, I don't know if any of you who recall uh, last week, or actually no, it was this week. It was earlier this week, wasn't it? Was it, it was Tuesday? earlier this week. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was on. Yeah. It was on the uh, the thirteenth. Right. So it was a Tuesday. And if for those of you who are listening, it says in big bold letters with red market sell off. Now, now I think the index was down like one and a half percent. And and the 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 humor of the theme was this is that we haven't had a down day, uh, like a, a relatively large down day in a long time. And so the first down day, they make it sound like this has been going on for weeks. 
the market's selling off. It was a single day. <laughs> it was like and 14 even, straight weeks of up growth in the markets, right? And it I wasn't mean, it's even incredible. Yeah, and it wasn't even big. It was like 1%, 1.5% one down day. It wasn't even like, if it was 4%, I'd say, okay, that warrants a banner. But a 1% down day? Come on. In 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 you know, back in the 1980s, 90s, you know, one percent was a big move in the markets. And again, the value of the markets were a lot smaller. So one percent, you know, you know, you know, again, still percentage, right? But we didn't see days like nowadays. One percent is a sneeze. It, I mean, these markets are, you know, I don't think people recognize how, even though the markets have been going up. In a with significant tear since the you know really since the Great Recession with with very few blips in between, I don't know if people recognize how much more volatile the markets actually are in the current era than they used to be. Um, when I get not getting in the weeds about how market makers used to work and how to stabilizing the you know stabilizing the the values of uh, of stock shares and things like that, but you know. And, and volatility is not a bad thing. A reminder that volatility does not mean the market is imploding. Volatility means the market is moving. And so volatility means good and bad, right? But markets are, you know, the markets over the last, you know, 15 years or so are wildly more volatile than they ever were in history. And that is because there's so many more forces, so much more access, so many more other variables that you're not going to get into. One percent's nothing anymore. We see those days all the time. It's crazy. Yeah, it's 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 interesting and I'm going to share this um I'm going to share this chart cuz there's there's something really interesting here. You know, we um we we're not unique in the world in that we we are um domestic centric when it comes to investing. Every country is more likely the investors are more likely to invest domestically than they are internationally. Always the case in every country. We're not unique in that way. Um, it just so happens that the U.S. happens to be one of the better places to invest and has been for the last 15 years. But it doesn't mean that, you know, it's necessarily the case. Now, if you look at um, if you look at this, I'm going to see if I can get a screen share here and do a uh, here we go. I'm going to share this. And while you're bringing that up, I'll just say that what you're talking about is really um, it's loyalty to your own nationality and understanding. I've had a gentleman who was uh, an Indian gentleman who about two years ago was saying, I want to invest in India. India is going to be really successful, going to be the next top market. And I think one of the charts that I that I found and gave uh, earlier this week, you know, week or last week is India has been one of the hottest investments in the world for the last, uh, the last couple of years. So um, and again, he knew it because he's Indian. He's from India. It's an area that he understood and believed in very heavily. So, all right, um, here we go. Yeah, I think, and, and that's actually really interesting because I've noticed it, um, a lot of our Indian clients they they a lot of them uh, invest back home uh, in large part because what's interesting about India is if, if back when we had like zero percent rates, they were getting like six seven percent, right? Which is great. Right. And other countries actually had some high rates, too, depending on. But there was some I, I didn't understand the full nuance, but basically there's something that I couldn't go invest six percent in India. Like it's it's uh, there's something about being a resident um, or a citizen there that gives you special uh, special rate. Uh, but that being said, so I want to share this chart because uh, we're talking about international, which is how many people are talking about Japan right now? Oh, interesting topic. How many people are talking about Japan? No one. Crickets. No one. Not a. There's. There's only Kirk, one. I know. I know someone. You. Oh, you've yes. talked about Japan quite a bit in our show. Yes, for I those have. That are listening. Yes, I have. But uh, let's keep it off me, Doug. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no. In, in all seriousness, though, I mean, Japan has been this interesting topic for a long time because they've been undervalued. The stock market's gone down for 23 years, I think, in a row. Not in a row, but the trend was 23 years. And only recently it started to break back out in the last like seven, seven or so years. It started to break out. And actually, oddly enough, I'm going to share this. If you if you notice, the Nikkei is back to all time highs. Wow. The Nikkei, which in the uh, look, I, mean, I think it was 1990. This chart looks a little weird, but 1990 hit all-time highs in the Nikkei. 
And then, as you can tell, we're into recession for a long period of time up until recently. And now it's touching all-time highs. Fascinating. How many people are talking about Japan? No one. Not a single person. I've heard one company, and they've been sending out this research on value investing in Japan for a long time, which leads me to believe that, okay, well, you, you know, a broken clock is right uh, twice a day. So it's hard to tell whether they're right or just lucky, but it's actually one of the bigger, more well-renowned uh, institutional firms. And so uh, I've been trying to get them on the show for a while because I've known about Japan being a great value and just not being respected by markets. Now, the funny thing here, and this is where the arrow comes in, uh, they've had two negative GDP prints in a row. And in Japan, that means they're in a recession. <laughs> <laughs> that's what cracks me up. I was gonna, I was waiting for it. <laughs> so Japan, which has had a rocket ride since it looks like the late uh, aughts uh, up until recently, is in a recession and it's at all time highs right when it hits a recession. Yep. How coincidental is that? Is it going to keep going higher? I don't know, but <laughs> it's very coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hysterical. They finally produced the best numbers and hit their all-time highs in a recession. <laughs> and you know, the funny part is if they were the US, then the investors would be like, great, you're going to start printing money. So we're definitely going to take it to new highs. And so this kind of brings us all back to really the point here, which is we're in a different paradigm. We're in a different era. The rules have changed. Things have changed. So the rules that you think have applied and and you think do apply may not apply anymore because if ja if Japan if the Nikkei is hitting all-time highs in a recession then it's safe to say that there might be more upside from here now we don't know i usually like to wait till it breaks all-time highs because until it does it's a big ceiling that you have to break through right remember they talk about the glass ceiling in corporate america this is a cement ceiling. It's not glass because what typically happens, especially in in charts like this, I'm using this chart just because it's I just happened to, to see it. But if you look at charts like this, there's a you know they call it um, a rounded bottom, so it, it like curves and then starts trending up. Now, if it breaks all time highs, that's very bullish. <clears throat> and what it means if it's breaking all time highs, then the upside is enormous from here. So keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind that that's a cement ceiling. It's been there for a while, which means that it could bounce around. It could break it a little bit. But unless it shoots higher and stays higher, I'd be really cautious at this point. Now, because of the fact it's a recession and we're laughing because it's coincidental, uh, but it's at the same time, it's actually it's indicative of where things go. So if things keep going higher. And by the way, just note that uh, two quarters ago, the numbers weren't very good in the, in the GDP number. And this quarter, they're only slightly down. So to be fair, yes, technically it's a recession. Like technically our country had a recession recent last year. And I think the Biden administration decided it wasn't. So not that that's their job, but they decided, oh, it's not a recession. So who the heck knows? I mean, these government numbers are always um, flimsy, no matter which country you're talking about. But I want to point out this example. No one's talking about it. We're at we're reaching all time highs uh, from a technical perspective. It looks very strong. And there's really nothing you can do here until it breaks. Once it breaks then you should consider adding this to your portfolio. And I'm not saying you should add this. I'm just saying as an example um, and illustrative purposes and all that for, for compliance purposes. But, you know, if, if, if it breaks out, this would be an example of one you'd want to buy. And if it breaks out and then comes back and breaks down, you want to get out, right? So there's a stop loss built in because if it breaks out higher, that's bullish. If it actually breaks out higher and then and then it's a bull trap and actually goes lower. What that means is that that's really bearish. What that means is that it's a fake out and it's really not going higher. It's going lower and get out at all costs. Just, just get out. That's, that's technically whether we're talking about the Nikkei or, you know, ABC stock or whatever it is, they, they're all technically this, these are the indicators. So, so this is a strong, potentially strong chart. 
which it's strong once it breaks out. The ceiling could be quite strong. We'll find out because it looks like it's accelerated pretty quickly in a recession. Um, so just something to keep an eye on. And and oh, one last piece. The fact that nobody's talking about this is probably the most bullish argument you could make about this index. And here's the reason. And this is something that most people don't talk about. So you're hearing it really on the show. Probably won't hear it many other places. The reason that uh, something like this is bullish, and this goes for any asset, doesn't matter. This is just an example. So no one's talking about the Nikkei. I'm sure people in Japan are talking about it, but nobody in the U.S. is talking about it. And we are one of the biggest, most liquid financial markets. So it matters what we what we think. Um, only for that reason alone. So the infrastructure of the system is such that there's money floating around looking for a home. You know, as uh, I, I don't want to misquote Jim Cramer or even quote him, but um, you know, the, the money has to go somewhere. So if it's selling out from stocks and everywhere, it's probably going to cash. If markets are going higher, it's probably coming from cash and going to stocks. So my point is, is no one's talking about Japan. So once people start talking about Japan, then the big money starts to go in, then bigger money, and then the retail people come in last, and they keep pushing it higher. So if no one's talking about it, it's actually bullish because that means no one is putting all of their money in. But once it becomes cocktail conversation, that's when retail money comes in, and, and they call Wall Street calls it the dumb money. Uh, the dumb money comes in, and and it just floods the market, right? And it just pushes pushes it up higher and higher and higher. And the Nikkei is not as big as as the U.S. markets and others. So if you had, you know, a trillion dollars, a few trillion dollars flooding the market, that could actually move the price. Now they're not tiny; it's actually a pretty big market, but depending on how much money is sloshing around, that could actually continue to... Remember what happened with Tesla? Tesla was in a range and it broke out and it just skyrocketed once it broke out of that range. Same thing, right? This is in a range. If it breaks out, it could skyrocket. It might not. I have no idea. But it's something to watch and it's something to be aware of. And so when you're looking at something like Japan, Japan has actually been a value investment for quite some time. That, the, that they had low PE ratios, the companies were undervalued, a lot of the companies were strong. And I'm saying this in general, obviously there's good and bad, but in general, it, it, they've, they've strengthened, even though the country, um, the, the, the uh, financials of the country itself were not so strong, but the corporations were actually doing well. Uh, so just something to keep in mind, something to watch. Uh, Europe is, is kind of at a high end. I'm a little more concerned about Europe, but... Um, but Japan has certainly shown a lot of um, grit and tenacity in in its in the resilience for for going higher, and I think we we may see that more. It may bounce around a little bit from here, but if it breaks out, I'd definitely be watching this closely. I live in the great state of Massachusetts. I may be the only one who calls it that, but I digress. The great state of Massachusetts has a commercial funded by the state that says. You can't win the lottery if you don't play. For the moment, let's ignore the fact that there's a state-sponsored commercial suggesting that you go out and spend your hard-earned money gambling on lottery tickets with odds of over 100 million to one of winning. But it's true, you can't win if you don't play. I'm giving you the same opportunity here in the show. The only difference is I'm not asking you to buy a lottery ticket. I'm only asking five to 10 minutes of your time. But I will pay you at least 100 million Zim dollars for your time. We do have some foreign listeners. So if you don't like Zim dollars, we may have some other currencies as well. If you want to earn over 100 million Zim dollars, go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. Doug, what are your thoughts? Want, yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, I think it's a good reminder of uh, the, the fundamentals investing versus in technical investing so what you're talking about obviously is what a lot of technical traders are looking for they're looking for these ceilings they're looking for breakthroughs and trends that will lead into all sorts of different terms i'm not going to get into and patterning it gets a little bit into the weeds um at the same time like you said how does this trend lead uh in terms of whether or not it's a great you know a greater investment or not uh, you know, that's going to there's a lot of things that, you know, Japan still deals with, with an extremely aging population. Um, and of course, you know, they've really had 
uh, significantly reduced birth rates. So again, what are the impacts fundamentally there on Japan? But I mean, if you think about Japan companies, they're still dominant leaders in a lot of different markets. I mean, if you go to the auto industry, most people will go back and still tell you the Honda and Toyota are probably the two most reliable, um, sustaining value uh, manufacturers that are out there right now. Um, the other thing that I, I like, think that this leads to two things is this is where a lot of chart crimes occur is because you're seeing where that chart ended. And this is where a lot of people will take the charts and make these arbitrary opinions or X or uh, arbitrary patterns that they will then justify and create uh, to show where it could go and how that's going to lead to these guaranteed results. And so there's things we, we look for is, and they didn't do it in this chart, but there's other charts we've got where they, we, they show that very clearly. It's like, hey, look, because it did this, look where it will be. Those are things to be careful of. And here's an excellent one that we'll come back to. Um, and then, of course, the, the last thing on, the, on that is also, having, is also having to do with what you were mentioning about the fact that it's quiet. When it's quiet, it, there's not only is it the, what they, you know, the retail dumb money coming in, but also a lot of times when you see a lot of noise around it, you have to, like everything you get marketed to, you have to ask yourself, Who's behind the messaging? Now, I'm going to use, I'm going to segue to Bitcoin for a second because we have a wonderful image in there of showing a recent, uh, a recent promotion that popped up uh, that where they were pushing Bitcoin using drones. Um, again, the push. Now, is Bitcoin poised to break out and go to $100,000 plus? I don't know, right? But the last time we heard this much momentum, and this much noise about it, the P, they had a lot of people jump in, just saw someone up a, a, a message that someone posted. There you are, right? It's just, it's in your face. Who's paying to put that money out? Now, this was put out, I think, by one of the fund companies or the ETFs, right? So they're marked, but how do they make their money? They're making their money by getting you to follow those inflows. Remember, though, these are things that are concentrated hell, holds by lots of people who the last time it got this popular, all of a sudden Bitcoin reversed and a lot of the late entries lost their shirts. I just saw something recently where someone just said, hey, I just took out a $50,000 loan to buy Bitcoin. Okay, maybe could be the best decision of their entire life, but it could also be what leads to ruins. Again, you know, what is nice when, what is nice when you see something developing and growing organically without that hype, it means that there's unlikely that someone is pushing a messaging there that could potentially be more in their favor than yours. So just something to remember. Yes. So I'm going to show a few chart crimes. It's chart crime time. We're going to come up with some good graphics here for the for the video in the future for chart crimes. But um, I saw a few of these and I just I, I wanted to um, show them because I see this stuff a lot. Doug sees this stuff a lot. And here's an example I saw, which is comparing the S&P 500 now versus 1929. And for those of you who don't remember, 1929, there was a tremendous crash in the markets. And and if you look at the chart, you're like, wow, according to them, there's a 0.94 correlation. And a correlation of one is identical, right? So if it's zero, it's not at all. If one is identical. If it's negative one, it's inversed. This is pretty darn close to one. And if you look at the chart, it doesn't look that close to one, but um, but it, regardless, it it I don't know how it got 0.94, but that's what it says. So anyway, as you'll notice, this happens to be right at the very peak before it started to drop, and of course, they're comparing uh, February fourteenth to um, August seventh of twenty eight. Uh, I'm sorry, this was I actually I don't. Yeah, whatever it is, this is not lining up in the same way. So they're they're comparing uh, a year and I think it looks like 13, 14 months, like 13 and a half months to, uh, I guess it's similar enough. But if you look at the time frame, it looks like they just kind of took a chart and just said, oh, here it is, and it might crash. So we've seen a few of these this week. I'm going to show you another one too. 
there's um, there's this one which uh, is I, I, it's not really a chart crime, but it, it's it's something where people look at the probabilities for the month and they say, oh well, you know, f- late February can be tricky for the bulls, and it shows basically the fifteenth of February is when it goes down, and um, the beginning of the month is when it goes up. Now I don't know in recent history I've noticed that the beginning of February is when it goes down, but Regardless, uh, they, they did the data, so I'll just assume it's correct. But um, the story that they're trying to convey to you when they show you this is now's the time to get out. They might not say that, but what they're saying is, wow, now's a good time to get out. It's the 15th. And this came out on the 15th, by the way. I think they did it on the 14th and it came out on the 15th. So the story they're trying to convey to you with this chart is that the 15th is the time to get out of the markets. Well, I don't know if it's the right time to get out of the markets or not, but uh, you know, in, in my standpoint, I think it's a very poor way to make investment decisions. It, it just is, right? If you're a buy and hold investor, that's horrible. And I won't say the name of the people who put this together, but they're dealing with individual investors. And you're telling them to get out of the market when you're more or less a buy and hold investor, that's terrible advice. Now, if you're a trader, Right? If you're trading in on the market and you're looking for trends and stuff like that, great data, right? Assuming it's accurate, right? It's great data, right? And you want that. But I'm pretty sure their clients are not that. So how responsible is that chart to put out for your customers or clients that's basically telling them to get out when these people are, are buying hold? That's stressful. That's bringing anxiety. It's it's really, I, I wouldn't want to see that as a client. I'd get scared. I'd be like, I don't want to work with these people. But but that's that's a that's a different story. Uh, here's another one. It kind of shows, and this is just a random chart. Uh, it's basically the net savings as a share of gross national income. Basically, what they're saying is people are saving less, uh, and it goes into recession. So if you'll notice, um, there's recessions in these years. And by the way, here are the times where it went below zero. Oh, below zero has ended in recessions. Okay, but there are also two recessions before this that didn't go below zero. So how accurate is this? So I wanted to show this as a, it's not so much a chart crime, but it's more illustrative of what we see. There's a there's a phrase I use um, humorously uh, all the time, which is, yeah, it's a great indicator. It's predicted 10 of the last three recessions. And so what frequently happens is when people come up with indicators, it's like, wow, this indicator has picked, um, you know, the last three recessions or um, Every recession was picked by this indicator. And yes, it may have picked the last 10 recessions, but it also picked 20 or 30 or 50 other recessions that never happened. So how accurate is it? It's not just the accuracy, but it's also the inaccuracy or the or the negative of, of the equation, right? Because most people look at the positive, like how many times has it been accurate? But also you want to look at how many times has it missed? And, and most... Uh, charts or groups that are putting out research, they don't show you the man behind the curtain. They don't show you what was missing. They're what we would call a half truth, right? The half truth is when you get something that sounds true. Academically, it sounds true. It's mostly true, but it's not 100% true. And the danger behind that is that people think it's true and they treat it as true, even though it's not. And it's it's actually one of the... Um, one of the forms of persuasion or manipulation that people use. So if you want to know if people are manipulating you, look at that. If we talk about in the show a lot on this, this indicator and says, oh, if you missed the, the 10 best days, you would have significantly underperformed the S&P by like 10% a year. Yeah. But if you missed the 10 worst days, you would have doubled the performance of, of, of just buy and hold. So they're only showing you half the picture because they're trying to convey a story. We talk about story on the show a lot because if you're getting research, if you're getting um, a sales pitch, it's a story. It's not inaccurate. It, it may maybe it's accurate, maybe it's not. I don't know. It depends on the story, but it's not necessarily inaccurate. But you need to understand somebody's telling you a story, and this chart is a story. And the story is, wow, we're below zero, and it's ended in a recession, so we're due for recession. And we show these charts a lot. Oh, wow, this is a bad indicator. It's going for recession. Maybe, but also if I look at this, it lines up for when technically we did have a recession and Biden said, no, it wasn't. So maybe it is accurate. I don't know. 
but it's still going down, which isn't good. And we still haven't had a serious recession, whether you whether you agree the Biden recession was a recession or not. It, it wasn't a serious one because the economy is still strong and the stock market's still strong. So is a recession? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know that because I'm not in the weeds like the government people are to to come up with these numbers. But I do know that there are a lot of indicators that indicate that we are heading towards a recession. If we're not in one already, then it's going to be close. So, you know, I think looking at these will help you become smarter investors because what you'll notice are the things that are being used to manipulate you and and versus the things that are actually accurate. And here's here's another one. Um you know, I see these a lot. Oh, this this happens to be on interest expense. Sometimes it's on outstanding debt. Anytime you see a chart that says outstanding debt's going through the roof, we're going to have a crash and a recession. No, we're not. That is not an indication of a crash. It's not an indication of a recession. If it is, it's coincidental. It has nothing to do with it. We could paper over money for years to come. I would say another 10 years, we could paper over all our mistakes and keep printing money. And it's not going to severely affect our economy. It'll affect it, but severely, not so much. Now, this is actually important. Interest expense in U.S. public debt. So if you think about like, Let's say there's a trillion dollars in our budget, right? And we've got 300 billion is going to interest expense, 300 billion is going to uh, defense, and 100 billion is going to miscellaneous, and like 300 billion is going to like operations, all this other stuff. So, and social security and all this crap, right? So, so if you look at it that way, right? You've got a third going to interest expense. This is money that doesn't go to our benefit. This is money that the baby boomers have spent and they spent it on themselves selfishly. And I'm a little down on baby boomers because we've got probably two presidential candidates, both of whom are 80, are going to be 80 and, and shouldn't be running based on age alone. It has nothing to do with their capacity. For yeah, I know someone will get mad at me. Just age alone. They shouldn't be running. They shouldn't be in the race. Um you know, I, I, but I think the baby boomers have held on to power a lot longer than they should have, in part because my generation, the Xers, have decided we don't want any part of the system. And that's our fault. We didn't take the power away from the boomers. So they're holding on to it, but we let them do it. So it's our fault as a generation for, for letting them do it. And frankly, we're, our generation is leave us alone. Just leave us alone. Go about your business. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Just leave me alone. That's our generation. So in part, it's our fault. But at the same point, you know, it's um, we could have saved it and we we, we kind of let it happen. So anyway, the point is, is it's showing that interest expense is going through the roof right now. This is a bad thing because the higher it goes, the less money that goes to spend on you, me, everyone else in public, you know, expenditures, whatever it may be, whatever the government decides to spend it on. That means less money is going to us. It also means that more money is being borrowed to spend in the budget which means this number keeps going higher. So it's a negative reinforcement loop. We borrow more, spend more. It's like, imagine this, you have a credit card and it's like a $10,000 on it and you have to pay, I don't know, let's say you're paying like a thousand bucks a month. I know that's a really bad, bad math uh, example, but let's say you're spending a thousand bucks a month on that, right? You got $10,000 and you're like, well, I can't pay my bills this month because that thousand is going to the interest. And so I can't pay my rent. So I'm just not going to pay the interest. Better yet, I'm going to go get another credit card. I'm going to use that to pay for my my additional. Uh, I'll pay for the thousand bucks plus everything else I need. So I got another card. There's another ten thousand. Then another card. Another ten thousand. Over and over until I got like a hundred credit cards, and I got you know like uh, ten thousand uh, dollars. I'm sorry, it'd be whatever. My math is off. Uh, like hundred thousand dollars in 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 debt, and now I'm just I got overwhelming interest, which I can't pay. And so I just get more and more credit cards. That's effective what the government's doing. Now, you and I, as citizens, as individuals, we cannot keep getting credit cards to pay for our expenditures because at some point the credit cards are like, yeah, sorry, you're cutting, you're, you're getting cut off. You're, you're, you're irresponsible and you're not getting any more money. At some point, the credit card companies do that because they're a business and they have to make money. So if everyone just took all their money and spent it, then they'd be out of business. So them being smart business people, they say, all right, you're cut off. You're not getting any more credit from us. Or we raise your interest rates up to 50%, which ensures you're never getting credit again and you're never going to be able to pay it back. But the government doesn't have that. The government can borrow as much money as they want and they can lower rates if they want because 
the Federal Reserve basically does whatever they want. So they say, oh, we're going to lower rates to zero. And then the government refinances all their debt at zero. And you and I can do that as well. But in the meantime, we can't go print more money. The government can. So the problem with this dynamic is that we are in a negative reinforcement loop that we cannot get out of. At this point, the numbers are such that unless we decide to forego uh, all of our defense spending, a lot of our, um, let's call it a public good, right? The things that the government's spending money on that, that go back to us as citizens as our benefit of paying taxes, um, that sort of stuff, like that's going to be less and less and this is going to be more and more. And at some point, they just say to the heck with it. We're just printing money and we're just going to do whatever we want and F the budget because the budget doesn't matter. And that's where you started hearing this MMT stuff where like budgets don't matter, deficits don't matter, debt doesn't matter. And in essence, it doesn't until it does. So they're kind of right, half truth, until it matters. And when it matters, it's a disaster. Like this is when we become a banana republic, which we're kind of already on the way to. Um and our money's worthless and we have a disaster of an economy because the, the the devaluation of the dollar becoming close to worthless. We become Venezuela and some of these other countries like Zimbabwe where they had hyperinflation. So that's down the road if we continue down this path. It's not in the short term, though. I want to be very clear. Most people think this is going to happen tomorrow. It's probably going to happen 10, 20 years from now. Like it is not close to happening today. But this is a sign that we're on the path. And unless they just take this and light it on fire... It's not going away. So just be warned that this is in our future if things don't change. And I don't see them changing, Doug, because the politicians want to get reelected. And the last thing, the first, if you don't want to get reelected, the first thing you do is decide to be responsible fiscally. <laughs> hey, I want to I want to turn this country around. The first thing I do is stop paying out Social Security. I'm going to stop paying out Medicare, Medicaid. I'm going to stop paying out welfare. I'm going to stop doing all these things. And we're just going to pay down our debt. Yeah, yeah, we're we're gonna get you out of there the first day. <laughs> Look what read, they did. Read my lips. No new taxes. Yep. How did that end up faring for George Bush? Yeah. So it's just, he re- once he reversed on it, it killed him. Every single person that's tried to be responsible has gotten booted. So I'm very interested to see what happens with uh Mile, I think Mile, um, who got elected, who's more of a libertarian, and that's part of his promise is to become more responsible fiscally. So I'm curious to see how that goes. Because the big challenge that we have as a country and and most countries have is when you try to become responsible once it's too late, you're you're really not making headway. The things you have to do are going to be painful and no one wants to take the pain. As as um, I forget the guy's name is a Chicago Democrat uh, is a um, what was the guy's name? Anyway, he said, you know, never let a, a crisis go to waste. And. The point is, is you can only really make change in a crisis because change is hard and it's painful and no one wants to tighten their belt strings. Nobody does. Imagine this. You're in a recession, right? We say we go into recession. Everybody's having a hard time paying their bills. And the government's like, yeah, we're, we're going to stop our social services. Uh, we're just going to stop them for five years. So screw you guys. We're going home. Like We're going to pay down debt and you all can fend for yourselves. How's that going to go? It's not going to go very well. So it's, you know, when people talk about change, it's, it's a pie in the sky kind of change. I mean, I'm with them. I want change too. But in reality, in order for change to happen, you have to be willing to accept a lot of pain. And I don't know anybody who's willing to accept a lot of pain, who's also benefiting from the government. And at this point, most of us are benefiting from the government. Most of us. So how's that going to work, right? Social Security, you're going to cut Social Security, you're going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, you're going to cut, you know, welfare, you're going to cut like, you know, uh, services, government services. It's not going to happen. So, you know, are we going to stop becoming the policeman of the world? Like all these things that require money, that's not going to stop. So while it's an idealistic standpoint to want to become responsible, I just don't see how it happens. Or I see how it happens, but I don't see how it actually happens, right? Like, oh, I see exactly. We do A, B, C, and D. And then these people get kicked out and the next people come in and they go back to the old ways and they keep printing money. I just don't see how it's feasible. Like you have to totally wreck the whole system to actually make this happen. And nobody wants that. No, even, even the anarchists don't want to wreck the whole system because that's literally anarchy. And that 
nobody wants that. Like that, that'd be horrendous. It'd be like the purge, the movie, the purge, like we don't want that. So um, you have to think about, you know, the ramifications, the ramifications of change. And this happens a lot. I'm just going to say this and give it back to Doug. But if you think about change, right, everyone wants change. No one wants the downside. And this frequently is the difference between the parties. One party wants one thing. The other party wants something else. But actually, they want the same thing. They just look at it from different lenses. So their uh, their solution to solving the problem, they agree on the, the problem is a problem. And they agree that it should be solved. What they don't agree on is the solution to solving it, right? And one party tends to have a little bit more hard-nosed approach, and the other party tends to be a little bit more, oh, we want to protect the people kind of approach. The problem is, is if that doesn't align with human nature, then it'll fail. Because that's like saying, oh, well, we shouldn't, like California, we shouldn't prosecute people for under $900 of theft. So what happens? You have bands of thieves coming in and, and blanketing the store and stealing everything that's not nailed down because no one's going to prosecute them. Oh, oh, who would have saw that coming? I don't know. How about the people who said you should enforce the law? Like, so, you know, I get why things happen, but if you're not thinking two steps ahead and thinking about the unintended consequences, then anything you do to solve a problem is going to fail. And, and I use that example, but it also applies to the other party, right? And like, oh, we should just get rid of the Fed and they're irresponsible. Get rid of the Fed. Yeah, that's a great idea. And then what? Like, what's going to fill that void? Like the the free market, we don't have a free market. We haven't for a long time. So technically what's going to fill the void is chaos. And nobody wants chaos. And it means lower stock prices, you know, lower bond prices. It 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 doesn't lead to good things. And for people to say they're willing to accept that, they don't they haven't thought it through. They haven't thought about the unintended consequence of what that leads to. It leads to chaos, leads to anarchy, it leads to, you know, potentially overthrow the government. Like that doesn't lead to good places. So nobody should want that. The problem is there's no easy solution to get there in like small baby steps because we're unwilling to accept small change. Only when there's chaos are we willing to accept change. So I just want to kind of leave with that because I, I think we all want changes in our country and politically and fiscally and economically. We all want the changes, but we're unwilling to accept the consequences for those changes. And unless you've fully thought through the consequences and you're willing to say, okay, here's what I think is going to happen, but I also know I could be wrong, then you're not a part of the discussion. You're not. You're just making things worse because we have a lot of people who have who have opinions who haven't fully thought it through. And one side says one thing and the other side says, yeah, have you thought about this? They're like, that's not going to happen. How do you know? We can't know. Like, you don't know the future. So I would just kind of take that to heart because we're going to have an election season coming up in the next, whatever, six, seven months. And we're going to hear a lot of, solutions in air quotes for those of you listeners a lot of solutions proposed and many of them are, are crap right and both parties many of them are crap there's a lot of political grandstanding and and it sounds good but practically you know it's like trump saying that he's going to build a wall and he didn't build a wall <laughs> he wasn't planning on building a wall he was planning on doing border security but you can't say border security because that doesn't mean anything. You're saying you're building a wall and all of a sudden everybody gets fired up. Oh, you can't put a wall up. It'll get rid of my view or whatever the reason is. But but reality was he was talking about border security. But you can't say that because that's not sexy. So he said build a wall. So anything politicians say is a half truth and you just have to take it with a grain of salt. So a lot of that applies to a lot of the stuff we talk about here. And that's why we share these charts so we can help you think about reality better and so you can make better decisions with your investments and have fewer failures based on information that's not really information, it's more of a story. So, Doug, where do you want to go from here? We got plenty of charts to go to. I feel like we're not getting through enough. <laughs> well, hey, that's fine. We got plenty of charts. We got plenty of charts to go through, uh, you know, and we can get back to some of them. Actually, you, I wanted to say, give you a, a little bit of a context on what you said. The quote you were thinking of was Rahm Emanuel. Yes. Um, yep. Although I know how much you love misquotes or misappropriation mm -hmm. quotes. So originally that quote has been attributed to Winston Churchill as one of the Winston Churchillisms. Mm -hmm. However, that turns out to be completely inaccurate. Um, it had nothing to do with Winston Churchill. There is uh, original att attributions that go back to originally being stated by Italian Renaissance writer Niccolo Machiavelli. 
Um, but it's also been repeated or attributed to other politicians uh, ever since. And uh, based on, you know, Freakonomics did some research. The earliest that they could find it being used was in 1976. M.F. Weiner wrote an article in the Journal of Medical Economics entitled, Don't Waste a Crisis, Your Patients or Your Own. What he meant was that a medical crisis could be used to improve the aspects of personality, mental health, and lifestyle. But again, it's been attributed to a number of people. So just in case anybody out there looks it up, and again, one of the first things you do when you Google, it'll pull up Winston Churchill. I knew you'd appreciate this, Kirk. It is not I, accurate. I do. And I also want to say this, Doug, that uh, I appreciate you uh, Googling this while we were talking. I obviously bored you to death. So Doug was like, this is boring. I'm going to look up the quote. <laughs> My job is to be here to be three steps ahead of you, Kirk. So when you're done, we've got the next thing to to, to fill in. So that's I guess, I guess I'm the comic relief then. <laughs> that, that, well, I'm, and, and listen, I'm just, I'm just the lowly I'm the lowly assistant. I'm the hunchback at Notre Dame. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm, I'll let you I'll let you drive with where we're, we're going right. on this, Kirk, because I think you do have another num a number of other charts. So I'll you know kind of point us in a new direction. I know okay. we're getting near the end of the hour here. So, all right. So I'm going to touch on two more topics here. Uh, one of them is uh, you, you actually touched on it earlier in the show and I want to share a chart, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, how we've been talking about this for a while is how the market is completely mispricing interest rates. Now here's a chart. Here's a CME FedWatch tool. And this is basically uh, the probabilities that at a meeting, they're going to change the rate to this, to this rate. So, the probability of them staying the same, which is the five and a quarter to five and a half at the next Fed meeting is 91 and a half percent. There's an eight and a half percent that they'll lower it um, 25 basis points. So that's how this chart is just a grid. For those of you listening, it's a grid. It shows every meeting date and shows uh, the, the rating ranges. And what I find interesting about this is that um, this will change all the time. This is as of today or whenever this was taken, there was no date, but is, as of today, let's say, this is the probabilities. And so if you're thinking about, are, are the rates going to rise or fall and you're using this as a structure of probabilities, I would say the, the discrepancy between how the market is pricing it and reality is significant. Now, we, this is not, we'll have to go back to like a month ago, we had a show, we showed one of these and it was drastically different. It was pricing in like four or five rate drops for next year. I mean, this one is this one is is probabilizing that's going to go down about one percent in the next uh, in the next whatever ten months. A thirty three percent chance is the highest probability it's going to go down a full percent. I think that's pretty high. I, I think that's a lot higher than it should be. It should probably be maybe, in my opinion, twenty five. Maybe 50 basis points would be twisting my arm. I'd say, okay, on the far side, it'd be 50. But I'm saying 25 is probably what they'll drop it, if at all. I actually think the highest probability is they don't drop it at all. Uh, but I can see if things get better, I could see them dropping a little bit, 50 at the most. But that's not how the market's seeing it. The market's not seeing that at all. There's a 11% chance that it's a 50%, uh, I'm sorry, a 50 basis point drop. That's really small. So... I bring this up because we talk about it and I want to put numbers to a, to the page uh, for each one of you for what we're talking about. Because we talk about these things because these ideas come out and then people come up with charts after and we're like, all right, let's share the charts with our listeners. We want to support what we're saying. We're saying it well in advance of seeing this. But, you know, we as we point out, like the, the inaccuracies of the predictions of the market right now are tremendous. And so if the market thinks, well, we're going to drop rates a lot. Um, and, and when the, the, the CPI came out this week and it was, uh, higher than expected, the market dropped one and a half percent, which is not that much, but, um, but the market didn't like that. And now we're back to our old tricks and games again, where the market just keeps marching higher, regardless of predictions. At some point, things are going to get ugly. I don't know when that is, but it, you know, the fact that it's mispriced, you should be aware of, but also this is where. Um, you know, if you, if you take economics 101, there's a concept, which is that markets are, they're efficient. They're always efficient, right? It's the efficient market hypothesis. Markets are efficient. They're always priced accurately, right? That's the thinking is that everybody has all the information. So mind you, I'm going to explain some of the assumptions that go into this. And one of the assumptions is that everyone has access to the same information. 
well, that's not true. First off, I don't have the same access to Goldman Sachs or hedge funds that spend a hundred million dollars in research. I don't have access to that. Um, also, it's assuming that all participants have the same set of knowledge and understanding of the markets. Well, that's not true either. If you talk to any retail investor, you know every single one of them is different. And they all got their opinions on the markets, and they're probably all wrong, right? Because they're just they're, they're just they're not living it, right? It's like it's like me going and practice medicine and I'm going to do brain surgery and assuming I know what I'm talking about. Of course not, right? I don't live that. I've never gone to school for it. So the the understanding of it, the efficient market by hypothesis is plat- patently wrong. And this is an example, actually, of why it's wrong. Now, it, we, we said on the show that it was wildly mispriced and we're not the only ones. Other people have said that. But the market itself is pricing it as, oh, they're going to they're gonna drop rates a lot. And they and they haven't. Even when the rates were going up and Powell said they're going up, they still predicted six months later the rates are going to drop. So they've been wrong for like two years and patently wrong. And so that presents opportunity. The market has a price. Let's say the price is, I'm just using this example. Let's say the market says the price is 50 and the price should be 75, right? In my Let's say in my opinion, it should be 75. Well, if the market says it's 50 and I say it's 75, Let's assume I'm right for this example. Okay. That means there's a $25 spread between what the market thinks and what I think, which means that if I'm buying that at $50 and I think it's worth 75, I'm going to make a 50% profit on that spread because of that difference in pricing. So that's a good deal for me as an investor. I want to see those opportunities and locate them and say, this is the ideal time because the market is not pricing it properly. And the market doesn't price it properly. It prices it uh, for what buyers and sellers are willing to pay. But if I'm not willing to transact, I might think it's worth more or less, but I'm not willing to transact, so my opinion doesn't count. The only opinion that counts are buyers and sellers. So take that in mind that the buyers and sellers are making the decision, not you or I who are not buying and selling. So. The mispricing is real. It has been real for a long time, but this is something you should be aware of because it's going to continue until we hit an equilibrium where things are a little bit more in balance. I think we're in balance now. The market's going higher. Inflation's going higher. Why the heck would you lower rates? There's absolutely no reason. There's two reasons to lower to lower rates. One, we go into recession. The stock market goes into the tank. Our economy goes into the tank. Good reason to lower rates. Second reason for lowering rates. Inflation drops significantly. We go down to 1% inflation or zero or whatever it was before that they argued. I know they argued it was like one to two, but I think in some cases it might've been negative. But anyway, if you go to a really low rate, that's a good reason to lower rates. If you don't have either of those reasons, there's no reason to lower rates. And yet we have inflation going higher. <laughs> it's a short trend, but at least at the moment it's going higher. And we have a stock market that's going higher. If anything, they should raise rates. I mean, I'm not saying they should, but if if I had to pick right now, I'd say you should raise them. Now, I think they should stay the same. I think they're actually good with where they are. But if they felt like, all right, things are getting too heated, they should be raising them. The market is not pricing that. I don't know if you noticed the chart. There's there's no chart that ticks on what are they? what's the probability for raising rates. So just keep that in mind um, with how you're pricing the market. And and I also want to point out one other last thing before we uh, give it to Doug to to wrap it up is there's a a chart here which talks about active versus passive. This is um, we may even talk about this more next time, but we have hit a point where 53 percent of uh, U.S. domiciled AUM is passive oriented, meaning indexing uh, things like that versus active. The higher that percentage goes the more power it gives to active traders. Not currently, but let's say this goes up to 80%. I don't know where that number is. There's a lot of debate about where that number is. I'm just hypothetically saying 75, 8%. If it goes up to that number, the active traders are the ones going to be driving the market prices. So just something to keep in mind. We're going to come back to this because it's actually a very big topic and it's, it's philosophical in nature because no one really you can't really predict the nature of that, but but it's important because it could drive the market in, in the next five to 10 years. Doug, let's wrap it up in the intro time. I know we're kind of running late here. Yeah, no. So, I mean, because we're running late, I'll keep this short, but going back to the thing of the, the chart about 
predictions. I mean, we, three months ago, we were talking, you know, less than that, we were talking about the 497 uh, rate uh, uh, rate decreases that they were predicting for this year, which of course, you know, I joke with the 497. But it, one of the other things I think uh, you might I might have sent you is interestingly enough how quickly that has changed is that now not only have they declined the number of people that of analysts that are predicting a rate cut, they actually now do have at least one group, City, that has come out predicting a rate increase. Okay. So, and like like you said, it it's not moving the needle. Like people aren't listening to the data. And that is a that is an irrational exuberance type of situation. And again, how long will this last? Well, in 1997, it lasted another three years, uh, four years. So, uh, you know, that's that's the problem with trying to make predictions. Um, but if you're going to talk about, or if anybody's going to talk about efficient markets, I think the perfect example of how inefficient they are is something that I think most people are aware of at this point in time, is going back to COVID. Now, not to sound politically slanted here, this became very apparent publicly, is that when they were making policy decisions around what to do with shutdowns, simultaneously, many Congress persons and senators were making investment decisions in their portfolios based on the decisions that Congress was about to make. Okay. That right there is the perfect example of inefficient because the markets were not, there were people that had information that was not publicly disseminated in order to make efficient decisions around the markets that they were able to make on. If one person has that power, whether it's insider trading, whether it's Congress, whether it's, you know, whatever the deal is, if one person has information that is not available to the rest of society, you do not have an efficient market. So the fact that this theory is still touted at all with all of the evidence out there is just mind blowing. So ignore it. It doesn't work. They're not efficient. And the economists that still push it are living back in the stone ages, probably having conversations still with Niccolo Machiavelli. So moving on and uh, tying everything together here again, inefficiency, college planning. Um, we're over time here. So listen, if you don't want to overspend on college, if you would like to be able to have less stress, if you'd like to have peace of mind, if you'd like to have the resource, I just talked to someone who said, I'm waiting to he see what we get to make some financial decisions. So in other words, he's waiting for the stress of going to the mailbox to get surprises. If you don't want surprises. If you want to know ahead of time so you can plan, we have a free tool at ProCollegePlanners.com. We're actually giving away full access to our software to where you can get behind the curtain, the inside information that you need to make smart decisions. Come reach out to us, check on it, because if you don't have the information, you're going to live in surprises, you'll have more stress, and you'll regret it later. ProCollegePlanners.com, check it out, or email us at info at ProCollegePlanners.com. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, Doug. We're going to we're gonna wrap the show up. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us in Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.